We turn our attention now to uh, numerical integration. So numerical integration is the counterpoint to numerical differentiation. What we know about integration and differentiation, right, is they are in some sense the opposite functions of each other. They're, they're in each other's inverses. And so we've already learned how to do numerical differentiation in the previous lecture, and now we're gonna learn how to do numerical integration. Everything can be found here at the course website, uh, including notes, code, data, everything that's associated with this beginning scientific computing course. So let's talk about numerical integration. It's one of the fundamental concepts that we learn early in calculus. Normally we start off with this idea of differentiation, which is the ability to compute a slope formula, instantaneous slope formula, uh, or a tangent line off of, of a curve. And so what we want to do with numerical integration is to start thinking about how did we find numerical integration and, uh, and how we're going to actually compute it in practice. So numerical integration was a sum. What it did is it took some function and it computed the area under the curve for this function from some interval a to b. So this is the representation right, of that solution. So that's what the integral definition is. And what we did with this is we said, well, actually, this is pretty uh, easy to do. We're going to approximate this sum area under the curve by basically adding up a bunch of uh, rectangles underneath there. And these rectangles will have width h and some height f of xj, which is the, notes the number of finite number of points I'm going to evaluate this function f. And then what I do is take these little rectangles and I make them infinitely thin, but I add an infinite number of them. So this is an interesting problem because again, calculus makes sense of this thing that doesn't typically make sense, which is how do I take something whose width is zero and multiply by something that's infinity? So you have infinity times zero, but from the point of view of integral calculus, the whole point of the integral calculus is to make sense of that computation. So here, what we're gonna think about with numerical computation is h isn't gonna to go to zero h is going to be small. Just like in numerical differentiation when we computed slope formulas, what we did is we went away from the definition of derivative where h was going to zero, just like h is going to zero here, and we said h is going to be small but finite, and let's ask what kind of schemes can I come up with. And importantly, not only do I want a scheme for evaluating this, it's absolutely imperative that I have some kind of estimate for the error I make in, in approximating the integral. Okay, so scientific computing isn't just about produce an answer, but also produce the answer with some, some way of assessing the, the, the actual approximation error that you have with a given numerical scheme. And what most numerical schemes are aimed at is figuring out how can I make the error better for you by using better schemes, okay? And so that really matters quite a bit for our thinking in terms of how we construct uh, integration schemes. So remember, this is all we're really doing. We're taking a function and what we're doing is thinking about approximating these things at some finite values, f1, f2. In other words, we don't really have a function in MATLAB, but we have as a vector of finite number of values. And we're going to use those finite number of values to construct, for instance, these rectangles and add them up to approximate the area under the curve. So something to notice right away is that when I think about taking h to be small but finite, I'm actually evaluating this, the function here at a finite number of points. And the way I've done it here, each one of them is multiplied by h. But one can imagine I could actually make this a little more sophisticated. And in fact, that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to have is what's called generically called a quadrature rule. So I'm going to approximate the integral by this quantity q of f where what it is, is a sum of my f evaluated at a finite number of points times some weight, okay? So the weights are sitting here. You have a omega naught, w naught times fx naught, w1 fx1, all the way to this. And so these weights are something, by developing different schemes, I will have different weights, which allows me to actually control the error in my approximation to the integral, okay? So generically, a formula like this is called a quadrature rule. And what we want to really know is, when I approximate this integral here, then the question is, 
when I approximate that integral, I have a quadrature rule that can approximate it, but I also want to know how much error did I make. And remember, for numerical differentiation, we often focused in, again, not just on producing an approximation, but really, how do I control that error? Because what you would like to do in scientific computing is to be able to say to people, here's my approximation to this quantity, and here is my confidence or my error in that approximation. Okay, and as one might expect, that error will depend upon the scheme we use, and it will also depend upon the h, in other words, the size of the box we use. So what I really want to understand is if I take h smaller, how does my error scale with that h? So let's start off with the very simplest of formulas, and this is what's called a Newton's Coates formula, and what it does is a it's called trapezoidal rule is, is the Newton's Coates formula, Newton's Coates formula, and what it is is saying if I want to integrate, let's say from x0 to x1, so over two points, I could easily take a trapezoid that represents this. So what it is, is the width of this rectangle is h, and then f0 plus f1 over 2 is the average height between the two points in my domain. So that's the trapezoidal rule. I'm going to make a little trapezoid or a rectangle, which is the average height between the two neighboring points, and that's the area of, of, of that I'm going to approximate this with. And of course, it's not enough just to say that's what I'm approximated with. What is the error? And if you use Taylor series expansions, just like we did in numerical differentiation, you're actually going to find that you can show that by using this, you get this term here, which has an h cubed in front of it times the second derivative. Now, what's great about this is, notice this is h cubed here h there. So this term here is h squared smaller. And that's exactly what we want to think about when we do control of the error because I'm actually going to ignore this, but by ignoring it, I've made an error which is order h squared smaller than my approximation itself. So this is a second order accurate scheme. And if you reflect back on the numerical differentiation, it's exactly what we did in numerical differentiation. We said, how can I use a number of points to push the error down and how's the error scale? Here, trapezoidal rule, which is the simplest integration rule, the error sca square, uh, scales like h squared. The Newton's Coates formulas, however, develop this idea further and what they actually do is start saying, how can we use more sophisticated ways to do it or use more neighbors to construct more accurate schemes? So this is a set of uh, Newton Coates formulas going from Simpson's rule, Simpson's 3 8 rule, to Boole's rule, and each one of these just keeps improving accuracy. So for instance, uh, if you look at Simpson's rule, which is actually very commonly used because what you have is a very simple expression, but now notice to do this, I go from not from x0 to x1, I go x0 to x2, which is I use two neighbors. Just like when we did differentiation, the more neighbors you use, the more accurate you can produce the scheme. Same thing here with Simpson's rule, by using two neighbors, now I use f0, 4f1, f2 divided by h times h over 3. Then notice what happens to the error. I use my Taylor series expansions. I add them and subtract just the right way. This is now h to the 5, which means it's h to the 4th smaller than this. This is a fourth order accurate scheme. So oftentimes people will generically use Simpsons because it's actually quite a bit more accurate than the trapezoidal rule. Um, and it doesn't cost you very much to use it, right? I just use two neighbors instead of one, and I get this nice performance gain. Simpson's 3 8 rule uses three neighbors, and then Boole's rule uses actually five points. But there, the error is now h to the sixth. So you could imagine mathematics has used uh, these kind of things for quite a while, and so we have schemes that can go order h eighth accuracy and so forth. So these are important uh, integration rules. They're important for you to understand that what we're doing here is using Taylor series expansions to approximate this function across this here and truncating it so that it can control the error I have on this side. So these newton Coates formulas become sort of the, the workhorse of, of, of basically producing integral computations. So how do they actually work? Here's just a picture. So if we're, if we're looking at a set of points in this uh, the trapezoidal rule is right here. It's just basically using two neighboring points, and that's the trapezoid you construct, or essentially you're averaging the height of this to create a rectangle. The simplest 
rule possible. This is what you typically learn in calculus right away is just add up a bunch of rectangles and essentially that's what trapezoidal rule does for you. <coughs> uh, if you're using Newton's formula, or sorry, Simpson's formula, then you're using three, you know, not just this point, you're using two neighbors, there they are. And what you actually do to do this is you fit a parabola through those two points. So by fitting this parabola, you can push the air down to h to the fourth and produce a much more accurate solution, but now the cost is you're using two neighbors instead of trapezoidal rule, just use one neighbors. Here's Simpson's 3 eighths. This is how many neighbors you use. And then Boole's rule, which is just five points, but this pushes the error down all the way to H to the sixth. So one way to think about it, you're approximating the solution through these points by some quintic polynomial to go through those points. So that's the, that's the basic structure, so quadratic polynomial to go through, quartic polynomial to go through those points. That's the basic structure of how all of this works. You're just manipulating Taylor series in adding them, subtracting them the right way so that you can produce these formulas here. And these numbers that you're seeing there were all based upon adding and subtracting Taylor series in order for you to push down the air and push it up to a higher h to the, you know, in this case, and h to the seventh appears there, okay? So which means that this is h to the sixth smaller than this term here. So that's kind of the main idea uh, between integral uh, of integral calculus. That's it, we're gonna add things together. So that's a very nice way to do it. Uh, the other thing we're gonna do though is come back to the composite rules because remember, typically what we're doing is integ integrating over an entire interval. And so what we wanna do is do that as efficiently as possible and do it as uh, not repeat calculations if we don't have to. So let's start looking at the quadrature rule then. If I wanna integrate from A to B and I'm gonna approximate this function, I'm gonna have a quadrature rule. Let's just do qu uh, the trapezoidal rule. The trapezoidal rule is right here. It's H over two and the So H times the average of the heights. So this is the trapezoidal rule. And if I write this expression all out, notice what I get. I get here is the area of the first trapezoid or the first averaged rectangle, the second one, third one, all the way up to the nth one. But notice, this is really important. In these expressions, you have an F1 here, you know, F1 there. So you have H2 or F1 here, you have H2 or F1 here. I could have just added those together to begin with. Because if I do this computation from this line here, I'm adding the F1 twice. So I'm doing twice the computational work to get this. Instead, I could just notice that they're there and add them together. And so now my composite rule, I added all of them together. So by taking the H over two out front, I get F naught, two F1, at two F2. So now I've compactified that calculation by understanding that each trapezoid, that F1 is, gets used twice, F2 is used twice. Now I just put them together. And so now this becomes a more compact formula here. And I'm doing about half the amount of work for computing this integral. So that's a composite rule. So very rarely are you just care about one little sliver. What you care about is integrating across an entire domain. And this integral computation here saves you about, it's about half, half the work in computation in, in computing something, okay? So that's what you're really thinking about in these composite rules. There's these nice expressions that you can use based upon Simpson's rule or trapezoidal rule that sort of uh, simplifies these expressions a bit. So let's write actually a little code for this. And I've broken out the, uh, this into Python and MATLAB on separate pages just because I wanna walk through two different uh, versions of this. I wanna do both trapezoidal rule and Simpson's rule. And I wanna show you the difference between them. And so let's start off with a Python code to walk through and just sum up, in, summing up rectangles uh, is, is what we're gonna do here in the trapezoidal rule and Simpson's rule is just summing up chunks of two, two, two rectangles at a time in some sense. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a function, which is I'm gonna integrate cosine. And if I integrate cosine, it's gonna be sine. So these are gonna be my solutions. I'm gonna break it up into 50 points, a domain that's some size zero to two pi. So I'm gonna take a, yeah, so domain of zero to two pi. And what I'm gonna do is break that up into 50 points. So that's my H is that domain divided by 50. In fact, you can compute the H, it's right here. So that tells me my little step sizes. And what I know now, from these formulas I've given you, is that my error depends on h. If I do a trapezoidal rule, which is here, it's order h squared error. If I do the Simpson's rule down here, it's order h to the fourth. 
So this one here is going to be much more accurate than this. And I can control the error by this H and the scheme. So normally what people would do is control the error with H and then use a higher accuracy scheme like the Simpsons rule versus the trapezoid because this is going to be much more accurate than this one here. And in fact, if you download this code, you'll actually can look at what we get from these expressions and you can plot it against the actual answer, which is given right by here. And then you can see how this act, how the how accurate these schemes are and how they actually fall off from the from the exact solution. So let's first talk about the trapezoidal rule. I, what I need to do is have a variable that keeps track of the running sum of my integral. So remember, when I do integrals, I could either just give you one expression at the very end, which is what's the area in the curve after I do the whole thing, or I can give you a running sum as I go across. When you say you integrate cosine and you get sine, that sine is the running sum of, of, of the integral. Okay, so that's what I actually want to produce here as we go along. So my running sum is going to be this thing called total area. So it's my, that's the area of the curve. And I'm going to first start it off by making it a vector of zeros. And I started off the first, when I first start the sum, the value is zero. Now I go into a loop and I'm going to start going into this loop to walk over and build areas of, triangle, uh, of rectangles or these trapezoids. So the area of each trapezoid, here it is. The area is h, the width of the trapezoid, times the average of the height of the two points, y of j, y of j plus 1, divided by 2. That's it. That's my average rectangle, divided by its width, width times height. That's the area. And what do I do with this area? Well, I take that area here, and I add it to my running total. So my running total of j plus 1 is this area plus what I had before. Okay, so when I first start this is zero, and I add a little bit, I get a new computation, I add a little bit, I keep adding to it, and total area j is now gonna be a vector, which is the running total as I go across this thing. And this expression here is just the area of each one of my little trapezoids. Okay, so that is my approximation, my quadrature approximation using trapezoidal rule. And the second code here, we're now gonna do my running approximation using Simpson's rule, okay? Now remember, Simpson's rule doesn't just use one little box from x0 to x1, x1, x2. It goes from x0 to x2, x2, x4. It takes two delta x's in one step in its quadrature. So I'm gonna again build a total area vector s, which is for Simpson's rule. But now since I'm stepping two at a time from x0 to x2, x2, x4, I'm going to make a vector of the running total, which would be of size 26 instead of what I had before, which was 50, okay? Because it has half as many points. And the first value of that thing is zero. And I'm going to start walking through. So my little area of each little wedge from Simpson's rule is h over 3. So there's the h, there's the 3. And then I add current point 4 of the next plus the one after that. So for y of j, 4y of j plus 1, y of j plus 2. I add those together. That's the Simpson's rule formula. That's my area in the box between x0 to x2 or x2 to x4. And notice, when I do this stepping, I go from 0 to n minus 1 in steps of 2. In other words, I step from x0 to x2 to x4 because each one of these wedges computes the area over from x0 to x2 and then x2 to x4. Okay, so I'm counting by two in this one. If you were to do Boole's rule, right, which uses five points, I would skip five points at a time as I do this. And then my total area, here it is, is I just add it into this thing here, and now I have an expression for the total area as I go across. And it turns out you can actually plot these, and you can compare it to the exact answer which is given here, right? So I'm integrating cosine, so it's sine. So I can actually plot my sine and then compare it to the total area of j and total area j s, and you can see how accurate they are. The h we used here is about 0.12, and so this scheme here is 10 to minus 2 accurate, so it's about down to about two decimal places, and you can see that actually it, that's about the accuracy of it. And this one here is about, with that um, dx, it's like 10 to minus 4, and in fact you can see that as well if you plot this. The code I put on 
online where you can download this from. Actually, you can just play around with plotting and you'll actually see this directly from there. Okay, that's Python code. MATLAB is a similar com command structure. Here it is, here's the MATLAB code doing the exact same thing. I define my function, I'm gonna do a sign here. So here, or, sorry, I'm gonna integrate a cosine whose exact answer is a sign. And so uh, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna break it up and again, 50 points and I'm looking at domain from zero to two pi. So that's it, exactly the same thing I did before. Let's do the trapezoidal rule, and then let's do Simpson's rule. So the trapezoidal rule, again, I start off with total area. This is gonna be my running sum, starts off with zero, and what I do is I grab a little bit of area, which is h over two, and the average, so this is the average height right here of my rectangles times the width h, that's my area, and I just add it to what I had before. Okay, so this is a little code just to say, just add up all these rectangles as you move across. When you do Simpson's rule, again, you do the same thing, but now you're gonna take skip steps. You're gonna go from x naught to x2, x2 to x4. So now again, I'm gonna do a loop for j equals one to n minus two in steps of two this time, right? That's what the Simpson's rule allows you to do is skip, goes from x naught to x2, x2 to x4, okay? I keep now my total area S, there's the initial value of zero, and then now in here I built a counter, just count one at a time to keep my total area S, and I keep these values here, and I add the little area of, of this thing, the Simpsons rule area, which is H over three, and then Y1, four Y2, and Y, you know, so, sorry, Y of J, Y of J plus one, and Y of J plus two, in the order of one, four, one as the coefficients. So this is just your Simpson's rule, trapezoidal rule. And again, once you execute these, you can get these plots. These are both gonna approximate signs. And you can ask the question, how well does it approximate the sign? And again, you'll see that Simpson rule does quite a bit better than the trapezoidal rule because this is order h to the fourth. This is order h squared. And you can actually just run this code and you'll see that directly. So this is how you do integration. You just add things. That's it. That's all we learned about integration. Of course, when we did integration and in calculus, we were trying to write down closed form expressions for all of it. So we were integrating everything and trying to actually take delta H or H going to zero explicitly. So we had closed form solutions. Here, we're just saying H is small. And in fact, by controlling how small it is, I can control the error because I have a Simpson's rule for making the sum. And that allows me, for instance, to make this order h to the fourth as the error. So if I need this thing to be accurate down to eight decimal places, I would take h to be 10 to minus two, because 10 to minus two to the fourth power is 10 to minus eight where the error would be. And so you can very easily with these schemes decide how to control your approximation through a scheme and how to control your error by picking an h. One last comment about this uh, is a lot of these uh, uh, expressions, right, these quadrature expressions allow you to do refinement. Suppose I do a calculation of my quadrature, my approximation of this integral, and uh, it's not as accurate as I'd like it to be. So instead of uh, having to redo everything with a smaller step size, you can actually use this, call these refinement rules, which are really clever ways to just add only what you need to improve the approximation. So if you remember, here is the estimate, uh, for instance, uh, maybe uh, of what we might use for trapezoidal rule, but what I'm gonna do here is use trapezoidal root rule going from x naught to x two. So in other words, I'm gonna take a trapezoid of with two h, and the approximation there is then two h times the average height, which then just gives you h f naught plus f two. Okay. So the reason I'm going to take a box of 2h now is I'm going to watch what happens when I, when I do this. So I could always say, okay, my quadrature rule now, so if it takes steps of 2h, is just, here's my quadrature rule. It's a sum of h times f of 2j, 2j plus 2. So when I take steps of x naught to x2, x2 to x4, I just add up all of those tra trapezoids or those rectangles, and this is my formula that I have, recursive formula. So I could get that answer and suppose I don't like it. It's not as accurate as I'd like it to be, but there's something really interesting to see in this structure, which is if you actually write this out, right? It's H F naught plus F two 
hf2 plus f4. And if I write my, my uh, formula here out, which is write my composite rule, I see h, f0, 2f2, 2f4, all of these. And so what's interesting about this formula is that you can make a connection between this formula and the quadrature rule for when you take a step size of h versus a step size of 2h. And in fact, here is this recursive calculation. You can show with a little bit of algebra, not very much actually, that the quadrature rule using a step size h is equal to the half the quadrature rule of 2h plus this extra terms here. These are the terms that are missing if I were to refine this thing to try to compute my area in the curve using uh, widths of h. So what's nice about this is if I have a certain step size h, and instead of, uh, if I want to improve my accuracy of the integral computation, I could always just say, well, take h and make it smaller, like cut it in half and then redo it. But what this is telling me is I could take my current, the calculation I have, which is on a coarse grain, to make it better, I just take what I had, divide by half, and now just add these points to it. In other words, I can reuse the work I already did. I can recursively refine this to a prescribed accuracy. So suppose you need an accuracy of some value, then what I could do is start refining my h, and I don't have to throw away the work I did. I keep the work I did, and I just say, Okay, if I want to now cut my h in half, just add these terms, take what I had before, divide by 2. This is the new approximation to the area in the curve Okay, with this new h. So this is a really nice way to start thinking about adapting your integral computation to take advantage of the previous work and to refine it down to where you need it to be. So these are all concepts around... Uh, integration that become important for just computing purposes. In fact, something like this you might use to say uh, what MATLAB often does, and Python as well, a lot of their built-in integration functions uh, often give back a solution to you with a certain accuracy level. So they don't necessarily know what the H should be ahead of time, but they recursively choose H to get it up with a formula like this to get it below the error that they want to give you back a solution with. I think, for instance, a lot of times these integral, uh, integration programs want to give you back uh, something that's 10 to the minus 6 accurate. But ahead of time, you might not know what the right h should be. So you can just progressively cut it in half and half and half until you get it down to 10 to minus 6, and then you stop. And then you keep reusing the work you did in a very nice expression like this. So that's all for numerical integration. Uh, we now have these pairings, integration, differentiation. Both of them go back to this very fundamental idea of calculus, where we have this idea of h going to 0. And we just simply back that off and say, h isn't going to go to 0. h is going to go to something small. And what I'm going to do is use my neighbors. And so I'm going to come up with a good scheme and control my h so that I can control my error and giving you an approximation for the derivative or the integral, and I have lots of schemes, whether it be in integration, I have something like trapezoid scheme, I have Simpson's rule, and then in differentiation, I have a second order accurate, fourth order accurate schemes. So you get to pick your scheme, and then you get to pick your h, so you can control not only the approximation, but the approximation error, and those are important things to be thinking about when you're doing scientific computing.